It is time for Chameleons and Coffee. And let's make sure that uh, everything is set. Looks like I've got some audio levels going on here. I've got the right camera. It looks like we are good to go. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. And it definitely has been a, uh, a busy day, our busy week with the uh, Chameleon Academy. Uh, as we uh, launched, I launched the, uh, the new Jackson's Chameleon uh, Care Guide, updated and greatly expanded. And I think you've uh, noticed <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot more in this uh, care summary. And there's always a, uh, a struggle as to how much information do you put in here? At what point does it transfer from being a, a uh, care guide to a book? And, and I decided, hey, I enjoy putting in information, so I'm going to see how far it goes. And that is why we now have a, I think it's like 10 pages. Ah, oh, good morning, James. Good to see you. I keep saying a good morning, but I guess it's good afternoon for her, for those of us on the West Coast. And of course, everybody who's on the coast and in uh, is good afternoon. And the people who are in Europe. It's all good evening because uh, we move in. Let's see, in uh, Germany, we're talking about nine o'clock. So, oh no, Howard says YouTube always cuts off the first minute. That's okay. I was just, I was just shooting the breeze, not saying anything important. And Jenny's here. Good evening, Jenny. You know what? When I changed the time. I got honestly the first thing in my mind was, oh, I hope this is okay with Jenny and that she can still come. And when I got your note that this is actually better for you, it made me feel so good. So I love it. Uh, Surf Panther is here. Christine, wonderful. Christine hung out yesterday when I premiered the over an hour long video talking about Jackson's chameleons. My goodness, you know what? I do not, uh, YouTube is not set up for like hour long shows and, uh, but apparently I don't care <laughs> and I'm doing it anyways. And, uh, there are some people that are enjoying it. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, if you, if you, here's a little, little thing. I try so many different things, uh, for this outreach I've put podcasts on Instagram. I've done, I'm now doing hour long shows on YouTube. They tend to break the mold of what's expected. And so, yeah, I don't expect there to be a whole lot of, you know, anything going viral because, I mean, <laughs> it's different. But uh, everybody, uh, if, you, if you like something that I do, let me know because uh, I keep trying different things and I will stick with the things that people enjoy and like. And, uh, I will chalk everything up to great experience. Oh, my friend Sean McNeely's here. Hello, Sean. Very good to see you. And we have uh, people from uh, Facebook. Uh, remember, reminder, if you are on Facebook, please uh, sign your comment because uh, Facebook won't let me see. Uh, they won't let me see uh, whose name it is. And Jenny says, I love the Home Alone scene. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, if you guys look at, any of you look at my, uh, my videos, you will notice there is a consistent sprinkling of cultural, cultural touch points in the video. <laughs> like, and I still love the John Travolta one where, uh, wondering where everybody is. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's for personal amusement. So, all right. So the, uh, the news of the day is, let's see, Bob and Genevieve saying hello. Hello. The news of the day is Jackson's chameleons. And this is a completely interactive session. So if you've watched the video last night, did you, if you've looked at the care guide and you have any questions about Jackson's chameleons or the care guide, let me know. Now is the time to talk with me directly. Put your questions in the chat and, uh, and let's discuss uh, because, you know, the whole purpose for this outreach and for this uh, care guide is that 
it communicates to the community uh, the best practices. And the one thing that I learn every year of doing this is how to better communicate. Uh, and and the information doesn't necessarily change from year to year, but you notice I do, you know, I thought I was going to be doing yearly updates, but now it's ending up I'm doing the updates every other year because it's amazing how much work it is. But I, there is different ways of communication. And even in this care guide that I put out, just put out now, brand speaking new, uh, is there, there's a couple of things in there that, hmm, just don't, I, I'm not terribly happy with, like the, the size of the feeder. You know, let's, let's go ahead and bring this up. What the heck? There we go. But if we go down, let's see. And I'll point out. Got to go down to the feeder section. There we go. So I'm not entirely happy with measuring the proper feeder size by the distance between the eyes. It just seems, and the reason why we're doing this is because it's easy to tell. And the size isn't terribly important. You just don't want to go beyond the uh, the size that they're going to choke on. So we need some way of saying this is how big it should be. And, and this is effective in doing that. So good, thumbs up, go forward. It'll be good for another two years. But I'm thinking I'd sure like to have it a little bit more realistic uh, to uh, maybe from the snout to the back of the skull, uh, the head. Maybe that's more realistic, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it. You know, I'm going to try it with different, different size chameleons, different size feeders, but uh, th that's just, er, there, it comes a time where you got to just push the, the stuff out and, and, and wor uh, work on the next one coming up. Let's see. Surf Panther has something going on here. Let's let's take a look what's going on. Hmm. And yes, even though I've moved this to the afternoon, it is still chameleons and coffee. Surf Panther, I have a pair of rainbows and have had issues with my mail, especially get mouth infections. No idea what I'm doing wrong. I'm getting softer food, trying to figure it out. Okay. Well. Obviously, I can only uh, go off from a high level, but usually mouth infections, unless it's because, uh, let, let's see if we get, so the question is, are you doing any of this stuff? Um, the thing with a mouth infection is that they are generally uh, generally because of there's a stress in their life. Uh, a mouth infection can come if it like chews on a rock or something and breaks something and the bacteria gets in. That's one way. Uh, but the other way is just through normal chewing. They get a cricket spine or something and the body is too weak to fight off everything, all the bacteria. And the reason why the body's too weak to fight off the bacteria is a combination of chronic stress points and a hey, reptile family uh family's here i still got to figure out how to pronounce that in the <laughs> the true language I'm glad to glad to see you there uh and so without knowing more about your situation let, let's with me uh try, whenever i'm trying to troubleshoot everybody whenever i'm trying to troubleshoot here I only get the barest amounts of your situation, and I really don't have time to get the two pages and read through it to get a full idea. So uh, when I respond, uh, please understand, I'm going to be doing it from a high level that's useful for a lot of people. And don't, don't take offense if it sounds like I'm being too general or that I'm insulting you that you wouldn't have thought about this. I, I I, I'm talking to an audience, and so I've got to be general. But generally speaking, when uh, Jackson's chameleons get uh, infections, respiratory infections, mouth infections, temporal gland infections, the bacteria stuff, it's because the the uh, the um, um, immune system 
has weaked, uh, has been weak. Don't forget friends to, Christine says, don't forget friends to like the, yes, thank you, Christine. Everybody like my video, please. <laughs> Let YouTube know that it's a good video so it gets uh, gets out there. Uh, but uh, especially uh, Jackson's Chameleons, we have these uh, this, this chronic stress. It's, it's like you add up all of this chronic stress and then you end up with an infection. And in my personal situation, I get this a lot when it's hot out when because I keep my Jackson's Chameleons outdoors. And so during the summers, if it gets into the 90s, I end up getting more infections. And that's because the uh, the heat is compromising the immune system. Uh, this can also happen if chameleons are paired up together in a cage. That's that's a huge one. Uh, the, you'll get a lot of stress that uh, people don't recognize. And you look at two, chame two Jackson's chameleons sitting in the cage, they look like they're getting along. They're not. Uh, Jackson's chameleons don't communicate like panthers or veiled. And so it can lure, lull people into thinking that they're doing fine when they're really not. So the biggest things, high te higher temperatures in the upper 80s, uh, cohabitation stress, not giving low nighttime drops. So the body becomes exhausted. And then there's handling stress to where people like to play with them. Now, uh, Surf Panther, I don't know what exactly you're doing uh, or what's the situation, but if I was in your situation, like I am, I am often, uh, I say, oh, what's going on? I take a look and say, what are the possible stress points? What are the things that could have been happening that uh, I didn't realize? Because we set up the cage. It could be perfect to begin with, but things always change. Plants grow. Uh sun changes position in the sky uh pets get new uh the new habits and all of these things can affect what uh what was before a perfect cage setup and now there's a little bit of, of a tweak and the problem is when you get a little just a little tweak then that sets off chronic stress and in jackson's chameleons they don't show you that stress and so it festers for a while until all of a sudden there's an infection out of nowhere. So uh, that that's, I hope some of that helps, uh, you know, I guess go through all the checklists of everything I said and see if anything fits and, uh, and try, try adjusting things. So, all right. Now, how many of you that are on here have gone through this, uh, this care summary and give me some feedback. How, what do you like about all of these? I mean, I, I can't imagine anybody doesn't like more information, but uh, I'd love to hear some feedback as to uh, what, you're, uh, what you're seeing. And the Surf Panther comes back and says, uh, good points probably means good points. I'll keep troubleshooting. Yeah, that's that's all we can do. It really is. We've got this baseline information but there's so many different things that could happen. And, and you know what, usually I, with me, it's usually not the stuff that I think it's usually not what I expect. And it's something completely different. And we all have to figure it out with our own unique situations because, you know, it's the only thing we can do. So, Oh my goodness. We have Gabriel is joined. Hello, Gabriel. So anyway, how many of you actually have Jackson's Chameleons? And do you have the Xanthalophus or the Machacos Hills? Or are you one of those rare people who actually have Mare Montanus? I know you're out there. I do know you're out there. I personally, right now, I have the Xanthalophus and the Machacos Hills. Uh, I used to have Mare Montanus. But my last one, I lost my last one in 2017, I think. Yes, 2017. So that was a, a sad, sad time. So Christine would love to have one. And um, yeah, they are so cool. They take a little bit, little bit different care than our standard ones. But uh Let's see, I have a Facebook user 
need it on paper first before I read it. Dyslexia. But I Kristen care sheet. Oh, wait a minute. I know who you are. <laughs> um, yes. Oh, by the way, everybody, if you like this, uh, this care summary and you want to print it out, I have on the website, chameleonacademy.com, just look for the Jackson's Chameleon profile. And there is a print file there. So it's got, it's a, it's a huge PDF, uh, but you can print that. Uh, and so that, that's where you can find it. And Sean says, I'm sure you're aware I have both. Yes, I am aware that you have both because you are, you are one of my reviewers. Uh, and oh my goodness, Steve's running late. Very good to have you here. So, well, uh, I, I will say this uh, care guide has been uh, quite the project to put together, and I, and I uh, I pass it around the community. As uh, I'm sure if you've listened to me, uh, I I keep talking about um, adding. It's not just my experience that is on these care summaries and care guides. Uh, I my experience forms the foundation, but then I make sure I bring in people to challenge me. And I want people to challenge. I need I need people who know what they're talking about to challenge me on all of this and make sure that I can defend everything that I put here, every word, every number, every concept. And so uh, this is and a lot of people help me with this. And I had uh, I, I ran by Dr. Chris Anderson, Jurgen Van Overbeek, Sean McNeely, and then Peter Neches. And, and also a special mention for Peter Neches for two reasons. Uh, first of all, he really went through it. He's out in the field right now and some, I forget where he is, it, but it's freezing and he's looking for chameleons in some freezing place. Uh, but he took the time to go through this and, uh, we went back and forth and back and forth, uh, on all of these concepts. I mean, I changed some of the natural history things because that's his expertise. Uh, but with all of the, uh, husbandry things, he challenged me and I gave my, my, uh, uh, thinking behind it. We went back and forth until he said he was satisfied. So, okay, I get your logic. And so this is, this is what we have to do. We have to, um, challenge each other. But, you know, not not a useless challenge. Uh, I have a circle of friends that are, uh, I, I know, are deeply experienced. And so it's not just challenge for challenge sake. Um, let's see. James is saying, very well put together. Thank you. Fun reading. Easy to understand. Great pictures. I enjoyed it, even though I don't have Jackson's. Excellent. James, I'm glad you enjoyed that. Jenny saying they are very rarely kept in Germany, but most people would need an AC and hardly anyone has one. Yeah, that is the one thing about Jackson's. And I, I think it's it's been deceptive that they've been so common in the United States. And, and that's because they, they came in from Hawaii, not because of Kenya. And they're not common because they're great chameleon pets. In fact, I, I would say... You know, don't tell anybody I said this, but I would say they're not that great of pets because they need that nighttime drop. And if you're not willing to give them that nighttime drop, then they're not, they're going to languish. They're going to hold on for a while, but they won't be, do as good as they can. And so you need to have that nighttime drop. And like me, I have to have an air conditioner. Simple. I don't have a choice. Uh, I have to have an, especially during summer, if I'm not keeping them outside, I need an air conditioner. And so that's, that's one thing about Jackson's chameleons. Um, and oh, I wish it was easier, but it is not. And like I said, th there's, there's no, no universal law that says we have the right to keep Jackson's chameleons. No, it's, if we don't have an air conditioner. We're not able to give a nighttime drop. Then there's Panther chameleons. Bob and Genevieve have Xanths, Rainbow Baby, and Honelii, two males. Okay. Oh, that's a fun, 
fun group. And but they are so incredible. With those three horns, live birth, they are an incredible experience. And I actually I wish Hawaii never happened because it's made them cheap. And so people don't appreciate what they can get so easily and what's cheap because these are just such amazing amazing chameleons let's see the bob and genevieve says so happy to watch i have several and all live outside including babies the heat scares me more than the cold that live in southern california yep that's exactly right the heat's gonna kill them uh, the uh if you're in southern california i don't know where you are but uh you they live outdoors year round uh, they can handle the cold it's the heat that'll kill them definitely let's see do jacksons in the wild have any antiseptic characteristics that captive jacksons don't have i don't think so i don't know of any special medical uh powers that the wild jacksons that the uh the uh the captive ones don't and, and i don't know how i would how we would measure that but um but I, I guess we'll say at least as far as we know, we don't know of any. We don't know of any. And uh, hello, Bill, chameleon people. Well, hello, RHH, 1962. Bob and Genevieve say they live in Costa Mesa. Oh, Costa Mesa, you're cl somewhat closer to the coast. You're in a perfect area to keep Jackson's year round. Oh, my goodness. Uh, going to drive everybody crazy with the luck that you have. You should be. You should be specializing in Jackson's chameleons. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. R A H is Richard. Oh, okay. Now we know who R A H six nineteen sixty two is. Hello, Richard. And we got Jason here. Jason is a huge support on Facebook, and uh, he's part of the uh, admin team for uh, Chameleon Enthusiast, where we talk to beginning chameleon people on all about chameleon stuff hey, i tell you everybody that whole facebook situation is really tough because facebook we have to be on facebook all of us who are uh, promoting good solid chameleon husbandry we have to be on facebook because that's where so many people come into the community and so we got to be there to greet them uh there's no way around that but facebook is such a uh such a not a, a a threatening place for chameleon people you say any because we have to breed uh and well we don't have to but breeding is a cornerstone of our community and it's what gives us our um our experience and uh, and our knowledge and but if you say anything about breeding or selling facebook will shut you down and so it's not a safe place for us we've got to be there but it's not a safe place for us. So it's a, it's a tough situation. Let's see. Morning. It's 3 a.m. here. Love your new schedule. Fahar, what do you mean? you? I, I'm glad you love the new schedule, but why, <laughs> why is 3 a.m. better? Please let me. Where are you? Where are you, Fahar? Let me know what country you are in and why 3 a.m. is better. I, I'd love to. No, why you're so happy about 3 a.m. That sounds like a good story to me. Uh, and uh, Howard says, wish I knew you when you lived in the Bay Area. Maybe post a vids. Oh, yeah. Uh, I enjoyed my time in the Bay Area. It was about five years, five years, four years, maybe. Enjoyed being up there. Uh, my wife and I reminisce, reminisce about that often. And hello, MNG, lol. <laughs> Katrina says, I don't do Facebook. Well, I'm not going to try to convince you to do Facebook. It's a very, uh, it's a wild west, wild, wild west place. Gabriel's asking, how different is the care of Kenyunga Carpentary from these? Well, there's only one person I know that has kept Carpentary and has successfully bred them and i'd have to go back that's a uh, mario youngman and i have a a podcast episode about it that i would have to go back and review that 
It's one of those species that comes from the highlands of uh, Uganda. So um, is that right? Uganda? Yeah, I believe it's Uganda. And they don't come in often. So in fact, almost never. Um, I would think that Carpentary would be even more dependent upon the nighttime drop. But we, I'd have to... I would listen to that episode, Mario Youngman and Carpentary, and he he bred them. He talks about it. Uh, I would. I'm just gonna go off off the top of my head. I would say that they could probably be kept relatively similar, except they would be much more of need of the nighttime drops than than the Zamp. They would probably react uh, quicker. Um, Katrina says, I have lots of questions, but not about Jackson's. Well, you know, Katrina, go ahead and put those in. Go ahead and put down your questions. We're going to have a live interactive and, uh, you know, if people come up with Jackson's questions, I'll answer those. But if not, let's answer whatever questions you have. Go ahead. Sir Fender says, I found your care guide very helpful. Excellent. Excellent. I made cage mods and adjustments. I added a heavier fogger. They spent a lot more time in the fog. Yeah, it's uh, it is interesting when you start fogging. You get you get to see some behaviors that you haven't seen before. And uh, for the people who want to start off fogging, if you want to get the best experience, then you need a hybrid cage. Uh, and you see the thing is having a, a thin stream of fog coming out of your fogger, that's different than their experience of uh, waking up in a cloud because now you're actually being blown with something. Uh, and so not every chameleon likes that column of fog being directed at them. Uh, but if you, if you have a, a general cage filled with fog, uh, you'll, you'll start to see differences in your chameleons and it's an exciting new era for us. Um, I tell you, I've been doing this for, for 40 years and, and I've been doing the, the daytime misting for 30 of those more than 30 of those. And uh, yeah, it, uh, it takes a little, takes a little bit to, to change what you're doing all this time. But uh, I have gotten such Great results with this new hydration method. Recommend it for everyone. Um, Inspector Gadget Howard is yawning. Uh, all right. Let's see. Jenny says, I finally started fogging. Only a few hours at night. Stone has been placing herself right in front of it every single day. <laughs> I don't know how they know where the, where the fog is, but especially when you start it, after they go to bed, but somehow they know where to fall asleep so they can be in the fog. Yeah. We'll do a veiled question here. Katrina says, my veiled four months old tilts his head back when he eats and drinks. Is this normal? Um, I'll say it's not normal, but I, it, I'll, I'll also say I don't know that it's any reason for concern. Uh, if he's only doing it when he eats and drinks and he's active and keeps his eyes open throughout the entire day, maybe that's just his thing. So, uh, yeah, I'd keep a, an eye on him because it's curious. But uh, I would wait until there's something that actually screams out something's wrong before I'd be concerned. I mean, she's asking which chameleon species has the most horns. Anybody know the answer to this question? Oh, <laughs> oh, Howard it was, is accusing me of starting to yawn. Yes. Oh, I haven't had so I haven't had a whole lot of sleep lately. Pushing this thing out in the video and the care guide was, oh my goodness, this has been quite the, quite the project. But uh, as for which chameleon species has the most horns, the species that you're looking for is Triocerus quadricornis gracilior. 
Uh, although quadricorns, quadricornis can have that. That's the four-horned chameleon, the one with the horns on its rostral. Uh, and you can get some, you can get six or even eight horns just all the way up. They're quite impressive. Uh, I am, uh, they, they're from Cameroon, actually Cameroon and Nigeria, if you want the Gracilliar, but uh, they wa aren't imported anymore. They aren't exported anymore. So we won't be seeing them. Uh, there's a couple of them left here in the United States. Uh, good old Sean McNeely has some of the last ones. Uh, but um, yeah, they're impressive species. Let's see. Bob and Genevieve say, I also have a free range veiled male from a clutch I had two years ago. Gorgeous, thinner than his brother, but always around. Seen him on the neighbor's power lines, then walking along. Oh, that's. <laughs> that's quite oh oh you're the one in, in, in costa mesa and uh, you have a free range okay yeah it's interesting there's places in orange county where they have veils that come back year after year and so there's actually small feral populations and um i haven't seen them yet i went and i looked i know where one is uh, supposedly haven't seen them yet but uh now <laughs> It's interesting we're getting hearing this more and more uh but everybody please don't release your veiled chameleons that could get us as very cool as that sounds and as exciting as it may be to have veiled chameleons uh that really messes things up legally it, it's illegal to do it it's not good for the environment and gives us all a bad name so uh, we can be amused and excited to discover these feral populations but i would never never start one and please don't start them because it just it just comes back to bite us and we want it will, would get to the point where we're not able to keep chameleons if it becomes a problem so let's just nip that in the bud um <laughs> Oh, Fahar is from Indonesia. Oh, boy. And enjoys 3 a.m., huh? Do you notice that Jackson and I tend to bask longer and more susceptible to stress compared to Xanth? Okay, Jackson and I, Jackson and I um, found that Jackson and I is more tricky to keep them happy. I haven't. Now, here's an interesting... I'm not saying this is it. I am wondering if this is it because... Jackson I Jackson I the Jackson I Jackson I that we get uh comes from the Machacos Hills, which is a drier area than where Xanthalophus comes from. Me here in California, it's kind of drier, so I can keep them both the same way and I just supplement water. You being in Indonesia, it may be, and and I'm not saying I know this, okay? This is just in my mind. Uh, and something I'm exploring, another one of those things I'm exploring, I am wondering if the constant uh, humidity, you have more humidity, if, you know, I've been to Indonesia and the Jakarta and the Bogor area and the Bali area, you have a lot more humidity, which is uh, probably the, the Xanthalophus likes it. I am wondering if the Machacos Hills does as well with the constant humidity. So, uh, you know, that, that's just an idea. Um, that I haven't played out, but uh, I'm exploring. So maybe, maybe that's uh, that's the issue. And and the thing is, like in Indonesia, I actually had chameleons in Indonesia. Um, when it rains, it's always raining, and so you got to be really careful about uh, having the cage be able to dry out because uh, I mean, you get during the rainy season and it, everything's wet. Um, let's say, Hey, Juan Gonzalez is here. Okay. Oh, apparently there was a, okay. That veiled was an escapee. Hiro says, is there a video you recommend for setting up a newborn Panther chameleon? You know, I have, uh, yeah, I have a number of videos. I don't, I don't have the links right off the top of my head, but if you go to my video channel, uh, just start scrolling down the videos. I know there's a lot of videos there, but uh, like uh, there was a time where I was doing a bunch of videos 
because people were selling panther chameleon eggs and hatching out eggs. And so I did videos specifically for that situation. And uh, so just scroll back uh, through all the videos. I, I don't know if I have a playlist for it, but uh, it, they're there. So they're, they are there. Jenny saying in the video you mentioned before fogging, you are missing the cage for a couple of minutes. How many nozzles do you have in a cage? I have six and it would flood the cage. Well, my whole purpose for misting would be just to put down a layer of dew because when I start the fogger, if all the surfaces are dry, the fog just bounces off and goes to the bottom of the cage. If all the surfaces are wet, then the fog sticks around a little bit more. And so misting at the beginning is just to prime the area. And uh, so if you have six nozzles, you could you could prime the area as I'm calling it with just what 10 seconds. You know, psh, yeah, you just turn them on and see at what point are all the surfaces wet. And then you can stop it right there. Uh, so there's no need to just do an inst extended mist misting session. So maybe that is the issue. If you have six misters, then it's not going to take long to uh, to get that accomplished. Let's see. Katrina is having a problem with humidity levels when weather is colder due to the heater. Yeah. I fog and have humidifier running at night. Any suggestions? Yeah, that, that's an issue we all have. Uh, whether we have central air, I mean, we, we get it on both sides during the winter with the heater, during the uh, summer with the air conditioner. And all of these central air things, they just suck the moisture out of the air. So uh, my, uh, since I don't know your situation, I'm, I'm just going to have to start at the beginning. So uh, uh, what I do is I have hybrid cages. So I have solid side sided cages. Um, acrylic front and um, and solid sides. And so the only ventilation is the top and a small vents at the bottom or a panel at the bottom of the front. And so that gives me some protection from all of my humidity. Uh, number one, it gives me protection against the, uh, the chameleon being blown on by either the air conditioner or the heater, if you have a, a blowing system. And, uh, and that really dries them out quick. And then, um, and then I fog and uh, the, the solid sides keeps the fog in and that's the best thing that I can do. Now, the question is, do you have a screen cage? And if you have a screen cage, then I would suggest, uh, blocking off the sides, you know, that, uh, that shrink fit window insulation film, $10 off of walmart.com or amazon.com. And you can do your entire cage, leaving just a little ventilation at the bottom and the top. And I have a video on that uh, somewhere. Uh, anyway, if you have any questions about how to do that, just let me know. It's on my website. Uh, it, it, I have videos uh, on it. Uh, but that's a way that you can turn a screen cage into a hybrid cage and you can retain that humidity. And then when you need it, a screen cage again, you can just take off the film. I mean, it's $10 an application. Do it once a season. Um, oops. Ha! My face is covered with the comments. Let, let's bring me back up. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much. So, uh, and, and Katrina, maybe you can tell me a little bit more about your situation. Do you have a screen cage? Uh, it would would blocking off the uh, the sides? Do you think that's a uh, that's a good solution, or is that, or do you already have them blocked off and you need it? more so but give me a little bit more uh, details let's see here's one i'll have to read surf panther is saying i'd love to see you have a chat on the benefits of sealed cages and open cages based on geographic location and species i'm in arizona so i'm sealed i yeah, I, I have a lot of these conversations and I will continue to do a lot of these conversations because uh, that, that's something we in the chameleon community need to get away from. This whole idea that chameleons need screen cages has hurt our community so much because chameleons need 
humidity as much as they need ventilation. And there's got to be a balance between the two. Uh, screen cages can be the appropriate cage. Uh, hybrid cages can be the appropriate cage. And a glass cage can be an appropriate cage, depending upon, it, it all comes down to how much humidity do you need. Uh, surf panthers in Arizona, and that's a typical uh, situation where the humidity is so low that, I mean, glass cages would be great in Arizona. And of course, with glass cage, you've got to make sure you're, uh, you don't have that heat retention. You got to be careful. You can't just leave your heat lamp on all day because your heat will build up. But there's no rule that says you have to have the heat lamp on all day. Chameleons warm up in the morning and then they don't need it anymore. So you don't need to keep the heat lamp on. And these are just some things that we need to, uh, the uh, the community community needs to embrace learning how to use different types of cages because when you have different tools, you are more effective in different situations. So it really comes down to your uh, your ambient humidity and ambient conditions. If they are dry, you need solid side cages. If your ambient humidity is high, then you need a screen cage. And that's that's really what it comes down to. Um, and the thing is, it's not a geographical uh, thing. Uh, if it was, then the people in Florida would all use screen cages. It is what is the ambient condition in the room that you have your chameleons because you can have uh, obnoxious humidity outside but if you have a room that is uh, being piped with central air your humidity is is changed oh, let's see katrina says two of the four sides are covered with the film i did see the video katrina will say to really get the best the the really effective you need the three sides and most of the front covered uh and that is really the way you've got to do it anything less than that and i mean i used to produce cages that had three sides uh, but the front was screen that provided the benefit that you could spray you could mist without getting the walls wet so it was a great benefit there was a good reason for the feature but if you really, if I, for me to really get humidity control in the cages, I had to close off most of the front. Uh, otherwise, there's just too much ventilation. So uh, perhaps try, you, you saw the film, perhaps try, uh, if you have the standard, uh, the standard cage design, like the Reptibris, uh, do make sure the back, the sides, and the main door, cover those with film. And I even go as far as, cover the uh, the flip up service door with uh you know cover 75% of it uh that's really what it takes to be able to effectively maintain humidity uh, control humidity that's, that's just something to try let's see Fahar saying wow you know bogor yes <laughs> i used to keep chameleons on bogor uh and mountain salak which uh, which is cold and humid. Yeah, it was right in the wet season. Always rain and fog every day, and my outdoor communities could get sick because of lack of sun. Uh, your outdoor communities will get sick because it's wet and rainy and cloudy and cold. And so what's happening, uh, if you're living in Bogor, everybody okay? <laughs> if you're living on Bogor, you start getting into the wet season, it's cool because you're uh, you're up in the uh, the altitude. And the chameleons never warm up if they're outside. If they're outside, that's the problem. They will never warm up. And, you know, they can have the, the rain is fine. The humidity is fine, but they can never warm up. And that that's where you're going to have a problem outdoors. So you got to bring them in uh, and give them a chance to uh, recover from that. Now you ask, well, what about when they're in the wild? Uh, the, isn't it cool? wet all the time the answer is yes it is that way in the wild but the thing is in the wild they can move around a lot more they have a lot more uh choices when we keep them in a cage they lose all of those choices and so they're stuck in a certain climate and and that makes all the difference in the world let's see we don't need that and fahar says i use a greenhouse at the west season good good 
And can you get some, uh, can you get light in there? And, and heat, you know, it may be difficult drying things out, but uh, at least give them some heat. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Inspector Gadget says, <laughs> sounds like Seattle. Yeah. Yep. Very much like Seattle. Um, except there's cobras in Bogor. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes that was a, that was a fun thing spitting cobras actually bill here in florida using your hybrid tall i'm 65 percent relative humidity and ambient temp is about 77 degrees uh is this for a panther chameleon because that's that's pretty good a panther chameleon or i mean just about any chameleon would be fine with this uh the 65 percent hu relative humidity is fine as long as surfaces can dry out. Oh, don't stay wet all the time. But uh, yeah, it, it's amazing when we give our chameleons humidity, they do so much better. Yeah, we got to be careful because in captivity, we tend it tends to become stagnant and that's not good. But if we can get the ventilation with the humidity, the right balance, oh, they do so much, so much nicer. Johnny says, my Jacksons really does well up here in Seattle. Yep. Yep, they will enjoy that. Now, <laughs> the, the snow may be a little much, but uh, yeah, they, they really love humidity. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody, I got to say we're coming up on the end of the year. And if you, uh, you've been around, you know that means that right now I am gearing up to produce the 12 Days of Christmas, which means I do one video every day for 12 days of things you can get your the chameleon person in your life or you. Uh, that's, a, that's a cool chameleon type uh, gift. And so I'm preparing, preparing for that. If anybody... Uh, if anybody has a specific uh, chameleon gift in mind you think would be just great, you can email it to me, bill at chameleonacademy.com. Let me know what kind of question, uh, ideas you have. I, I have I, I have more than 12 ideas, but I'm always in the, uh, I'm always looking out for if there's anything better. Yeah, you just let me know. And, uh, and what I'll do is probably starting right after Thanksgiving, Maybe the Monday after Thanksgiving, I'll start this because I want to do this 12 days you know, before I did it in December. But you know what? I want to give you guys the chance, the time to order it and for it to actually come in. Uh, so we don't want to get too far into December before doing this. Let's see. Jenny says, what would you suggest doing when the soil in the cage never dries out? Drainage is good, but the top is always wet. Well, the only thing you can do is get some air going across that. Uh, although the question is, are you seeing any problem with it? You know, when you say it never dries out, uh, th there will be, I mean, like my cage floors, are pretty well moist all the time. They've got a leaf layer on it, so they're not going to evaporate. Um, and so that's what I want, is it to be just a little bit moist. Um, but yeah, the if your drainage is good, but it's still wet, you know, I, I'm thinking the, all, he, all he can do is uh, put a fan across it. Maybe that. I don't think I'm being very useful on this one. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, an enclosure. Yeah, that would be a good gift. Actually, I'm thinking about a, maybe I'll do a, uh, I'll do a one day on the leap enclosure because, yeah, although I, one of these days I should be selling my own enclosures. I, I think that's, <laughs> I think I need to, need to sell my own enclosures. But uh, uh, these leap ones, have been a lot of fun. I, I've actually, it's been a long time since I've had fun putting together an enclosure, but I love doing these bioactive ones. So maybe I'll just do one of these 
Um, they're not they're not good for the Panthers. They're not good for the Veiled. It's it's very specialty. But um, I've enjoyed doing that because I, I've started to really like isopods. All right, Jenny. <laughs> ugly. I want to do a gift of an ugly chameleon Christmas sweater. Oh, do, is there an Amazon link for that? And uh, excuse me, oh, got something in my eye. MG, MNG saying, can you get four horned chameleons captive bred or just wild caught? You can only get them captive bred if you can get them. Uh, wild caught are not available. They are, uh, Cameroon is not letting them out. So uh, you cannot find wild caught. And it's almost to the point where you cannot find captive bred. You have to really know who is breeding them because as far as I know, there is one, maybe two people that are still breeding them. They have uh, essentially are going to be extinct from captivity soon. So uh, this, is a, this is another example of chameleons that were coming in in large numbers and then they stopped and we're done and uh actually i was working on establishing quadricornis in captivity with a large group when and, and i got a, a bunch of people working with me and then the uh the ban on imports or exports happened before we could really establish everything i just got a good start but I was only halfway to the point where I could get a a good, good, solid breeding group. And uh, unfortunately, I, I sent all of mine. I had to move, so I sent mine to the other people working with them. And uh, uh, since there was a small number, uh, it, it, that was, what, seven years ago? It's, uh, since there was only a small number, uh, it, it they've died out. That's unfortunate. He says, magnetic vine holder from Etsy, Wally's Reptiles. All right, Wally's Reptiles. Here. All right, I'm going to check it out. Johnny says, my female Jackson is getting to be about a year old. Should I mate her or court her with a bachelor for Christmas? <laughs> Uh, if they are getting to be about a year old, I would mate her as soon as possible. Uh, I have had problems with females that if, um, and, and I'm not saying this is a thing that everybody is going to be experienced, excuse me, everybody's going to be experiencing. This is something that I have noted and I've, and, and I have a mental note to ask people about it and check. Uh, but it, in my experience, after once a female becomes sexually mature, you can mate her. I can mate her. But if I wait too long and I have a, a virgin female that is like two years old, I have a real hard time mating her. And, and I don't know if that's the thing that everybody's going to experience. That's what I've experienced. And so it's something I'm kind of checking out. But, uh, me personally, I would recommend that you breed her as soon as possible just to make sure. And then and you can just breed her and she'll have uh, she'll be using that mating for multiple clutches. Let's see. Is there a place to find captive bred feeder moths or butterflies? I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I don't know any. And then for her and everybody, we're coming to the end of the hour. Uh, if you have any more questions, go ahead and put them in. We'll do a couple more questions. Uh, and, and I really appreciate you all coming here. It's been really great having you. Did you bring your Jacksons when you worked on Bogor? Did they do well? Would it be too warm for most part of Bogor in low altitude? Uh, the problem with the Jacksons was that it never warm they ne they could never dry off it was they were just cold and wet and they needed uh they needed uh, they needed better than that um and uh it became a problem i had a real problem with fungus uh 
So it would be warm for most part of Bogor. Uh, during the summer in Bogor, the uh, it was just water, providing them with water, and they did excellently. Oh, my goodness. They loved the summer. Loved the summer. Oh. All right, all. Uh, if you want to, I want to uh, encourage you all uh, to check out Chameleon Forms. You remember how I uh, I got into a conversation about Facebook, about how uh, how uh, aggressive and uh, unwelcoming they are to chameleon people. Um, and so I don't, even though we have to be there for the beginners, if you are already established, I want to encourage you to check out chameleonforums.com. It is a forum for the chameleon community and breeders are obviously welcome there. And so the breed, if you breed something, you can find people to take the offspring. And that is the critical point to any breeding program. And if you post that on Facebook or Instagram, you're going to get your account taken down. You may get your account taken down. And so you can't, we can't function as a community under those conditions. So I'd like to encourage all of you to check out Chameleon Forms. It used to be the big thing before Facebook. Uh, in the chameleon community that was the center of the chameleon community but uh, i am i'm suggesting that we rediscover it and go back because it's a healthy place for us to put our efforts facebook's not a healthy place uh for us to establish a community we've got to be there me and my team we've got to be there to welcome the new people in and help them because that's where they're coming in but it's not a place that's good for all of us to stay we could be kicked off of Facebook at any time. So uh, check out chameleonforums.com. I'm there and I've got a blog that I talk about all this stuff and I invite you, check out the blog, check out the uh, Chameleon Academy. But actually it's Dare Mences Blue. I want to see if I can change that. I wonder if that, if I would be given an exception to be able to do that. But uh, let's see. Katrina says, thank you for the advice and all your hard work. Katrina, thank you very much. I'm glad you appreciate that and that you're enjoying that. So, and Jenny says, uh, for if you want butterflies, look into wedding butterfly release. Hmm. <laughs> Never thought about that. Hey, Karina. Ah, Katrina says she's on uh, Chameleon Forms. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I'm there too under Daramensis Blue. And, and I had that name long before I did any podcast or started my caging company <laughs> long time ago. So, uh, uh, but, uh, I have a blog there uh, that I do this, uh, the, like the chameleon hour. And the thing with blogs there is they don't, they don't seem to be on the mainstream. And so, uh, there, there isn't a whole lot of activity and traffic around my blog there, but, uh, that's okay. Actually, that's okay. I, kind of enjoy having a my own little private digital place but you can find me there and uh, and we can continue this conversation on the chameleon forms so sir reggie all right katrina i will look for sir reggie and uh, you here you know what this is what i do this is what i do for all my notes <laughs> so find uh find my blog for dermans is blue where i talk about the chameleon hour and the jacksons this Jackson's review and, uh, and say hello. And, uh, that way uh, I can say hello back. So everyone, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, the next live session I will have is on Instagram Tuesday evening. And I, uh, will be doing this again next week. Now I'll have to get back to you as to the time. Uh, I was originally scheduled for in the morning. I've got to check. I was going to have a guest. I got to check to make sure that uh, my guest is okay with this time change. But uh, so stay tuned and I'll let you know what's going on. Thank you very much for joining. Oh, Rob, good night to you as well. Bob and Genevieve, uh, thank you. And so everybody have a good weekend and I will see you later.